All right. Um, we talked about how to uh, make esters. Let's say you have one ester and you want to make a different ester. How would you do that? Attacking with another alcohol? Yeah, for example, let's say you wanted to do this reaction. What would we attack this with? Introduce the OET, but it, it, uh, it will start with an extra H. So you would introduce it with uh, ethanol. And by the way, what would the other product be? Methanol, because this leaving group is going to leave. When this leaving group leaves, it's going to gain a proton, and when the nucleophile attacks, it's going to lose a proton. Um, so you would attack this with ethanol to make this ester. That's called transesterification. You probably heard that term. It doesn't really matter whether you've heard the term or not. The important thing is to see that transesterification is just another example of all these types of nucleophilic attack on carboxylic acids and acid derivatives. There's many different names here, but it's crucial to realize the different names don't really refer to different reactions. They're all variations on the same thing. Yeah. Transesterification is just a variation on all these things we've been talking about. Which but is it, yeah. it helps to like yeah. see it that way, like for, to actually just change the ester, because in the book they don't do it like that. They just show you like the reaction. Right. But okay. How the yeah. Makes sense. Good. Okay. Good. <laughs> yes. That's good. Um, and again, we hope we can see that it's just a, another a type of these other patterns here. Right. And again, because that's so clear to the person that wrote the book, they probably they don't spend that much time on any of these reactions because they say, well, this is just like all these other patterns over here. All right. So we could easily make the ester into another uh, ester. Um, how about if you? Uh, yeah. Uh, and, how, and we already talked about how to make these with uh, amines or ammonia. How could we make these into um, carboxylic acids? What nucleophile would we use to turn these into carboxylic acids? Water. Yeah, water, because we want to add an OH. But before it attacks, it has an extra H. So if you attack with water, after it attacks, it will lose an H. So all of them can turn into carboxylic acids. That's right. They're all able to turn into carboxylic acids. And remember, the name for that reaction is hydrolysis. There can be ester hydrolysis or amide hydrolysis or acyl halide hydrolysis. Remember, that's another reason why these are called carboxylic acid derivatives. A carboxylic acid derivative is something which, when you hydrolyze it, turns into a carboxylic acid. So that's a hydrolysis is another very important reaction. But it's just another example of all the, uh, these other reactions that we've already seen. Now, we know that some of these reactions might require catalysts. Would reactions for acyl halides or anhydrides require catalysts? No, because no, they're so reactive. Usually, though, reactions for esters require a catalyst. Usually, either an acid or a base catalyst would work. These are lower down, so these usually do require a catalyst. Um, and how about reactions for amides? Well, that's kind of a trick question. There actually are not very many reactions for amides, because these are already the most stable. Remember, you can't really go directly from amide to any of these things like you could. For example, you would not attack this with a alcohol to make an ester. That would not give you a good yield because that would be moving uphill. Um, the one thing you can do with an amide is hydrolysis. All of these things can be hydrolyzed. Um, there's, yeah. there's no, oh, well, if you want to turn the amide into an ester, then you'd first turn it into a carboxylic acid and then turn it into an ester? Yes, that would be a good path. First, you could turn it into a carboxylic acid with hydrolysis. And we know that we can turn the uh, carboxylic acid into an ester by attacking with an alcohol. So the only way to move up the chart is by first hydrolyzing them and then? That is the best way, yeah. Okay. The best way is to do that. Can I think of any other ways? So yeah, one other point here. How can we get to the top of the chart? How can we get to the top of the chart? Because none of these can go directly into here. So how do we get, if we can just get to the top of the chart, we're sitting pretty, because then we can make everything else. But how do we get, do you guys remember the reaction that we used to make acyl halides? There's one key reaction. Addition elimination. Addition elimination. Well, that was what we were saying wouldn't work here, because this is at the uh, top of the chart. Is it um, like turning it into an enolate and then adding like Br2? Uh, let's see. That would be something different, because that would be a halogenation. Very oh, and that would put a halogen on the alpha carbon, not on the carbonyl carbon. So that's a different reaction. So the reaction that I was going for was, have you seen this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. 
This is a trick that we can use to get to the top of the table. Okay. Um, they talk about the mechanism for this, I think, in the book, but I don't think it's a good use of our time to go through that. We can just memorize this. If you don't worry about the mechanism, this is very simple. You simply replace the OH L group with a chlorine L group. Yeah. Well, we have to know the mechanism anyway. So oh, yeah? Okay. For the last test. Very good. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, in future, I don't think you'll be testing on the mechanism again. Um, but you will have stuff to use this reaction. Okay, and you can see why this is so useful, because it puts us at the top of the hill. And then we can make anything that we want that's down lower down on the hill. And how can we make the carboxylic acid in the first place? Well, by hydrolyzing any of these. Any of these can hydrolyze to a carboxylic acid, and then the carboxylic acid can be turned into this, and then you can make any of these other things that you want. So that's one good approach for synthesis. Incidentally, one of you guys mentioned addition elimination a second ago. So I just wanted to emphasize that this is addition elimination. What we've been talking about is the addition elimination reaction. Remember, addition is when you remove a pi bond, and elimination is when you form a pi bond. So it's logical to call this an addition elimination reaction. That's just the general name for all these nucleophilic attacks. Remember that aldehydes and ketones don't go through addition elimination because they can't reform the pi bond. They can't do the elimination step. They can only do the addition step. Aldehydes and ketones can only do the nucleophilic addition, but carboxylic acids and acid derivatives can do both the addition and then the elimination. Okay, so that's uh, a good overview of the general principles here for uh, using these uh, carboxylic acid um, derivatives. And we already talked about some of the mechanisms, precise mechanisms before, and there's a lot of examples of the mechanisms in the videos. So we can kind of go on to the next chapter. Um, so, again, everything we've been talking about here is how carbonyl carbons are electrophilic. How carbonyl carbons are electrophilic. But there's one other thing we've learned about carbonyls. Besides the fact that carbonyl carbons are electrophilic, we've also learned that the alpha carbon next to a carbonyl carbon can be made nucleophilic. And that's the other big thing that we've seen. Not only is the carbonyl carbon electrophilic, but the alpha carbon that's next to the carbonyl can be deprotonated and made into an enolate which is nucleophilic. And that's not just for aldehydes and ketones. Any alpha carbon has the potential to be deprotonated. Almost. Remember, what happens in an aldol condensation? Well, what is an aldol condensation, just in very general terms? How does an aldol condensation fit into all the stuff we were just talking about? Um, you make an enolate from carbonyl, and it attacks the carbonyl carbon. Or, or it attacks Yeah, it attacks the carbonyl, carbonyl carbon, carbon, carbon and makes a hydroxy group, and then the condensation part eliminates the hydroxy group and turns it into an alkene bond. Right. And if you don't condensate, it just leaves it as it's alpha beta unsaturated or alpha beta hydroxy. That sounds good. Now, you were correct that we, so who's the nucleophile going to be? Alpha carbon of the carbonyl. That's right, the enolate alpha carbon. Aldol condensation uses the enolate alpha carbon as the nucleophile. And who's the electrophile? You said it was a carbonyl. But what types of carbonyls get attacked in aldol condensations? What functional groups? Uh, uh, what? what type of, remember, there's lots of things that have carbonyls. There are aldehydes, there's ketones, there's acyl halides, there are hydrides. That's right. So that was the one thing that you guys left out in your description. An aldol condensation is when an enolate attacks an aldehyde or a ketone. An aldol condensation is when an enolate attacks an aldehyde or a ketone. You were actually taking that for granted because you were describing how it could be either a category one or a category three reaction. If it was a category one reaction, the enolate under cold conditions would attack once and we would get the beta hydroxy. But if it was under hot conditions, it would be category three and the enolate would attack twice and we would get the alpha beta unsaturated. 
So the reason, so it can be either category one or three because we're attacking an aldehyde or a ketone. So an aldol condensation is when an enolate attacks an aldehyde or a ketone. The Clayson condensation is when an enolate attacks a carboxylic acid derivative, especially an ester. 